And one time I was in Beijing, actually they were doing a state dinner in my honor uh, in, in People's Hall in Tiananmen Square. And the government officials were there and I was very honored to be, a, be honored by the government in China. Uh, and while I was there, the professors over at Peking University heard that I was there and they said, Can, let's invite Rick Warren and his team over to, to talk with us. Peking University is the only university in Pe Beijing that's still called Peking. It's the Harvard of China, 50,000 students. Every communist leader in China is trained at the Harvard of China, Peking University. So we went and we had a wonderful time with these um, uh, professors, had a good discussion with them, it was very friendly. One of the men that I met there was with a man named Professor Joe. Professor Joe was an older man. He'd been a professor there for 50 years and now was the provost of Peking University, highest level. When we finished our little discussion, I said, hey, let's just go out to, to dinner. So we go and we sit down. We're having this wonderful dinner with some of these Chinese officials. And all of a sudden, Professor Joe opens up and he says, I'm dying. I have a brain tumor and it's inoperable and I'm terminal. And he was scared to death. This is a man facing an impossible problem. He's at the end of his rope. We don't know what to do. We see no, no way out of this. He had no hope in Jesus Christ. He had no hope in God's grace. He had no hope even in an afterlife. He, his, the way it looked to him is, I've got an incurable problem. There's no power to help me. And um, when I die, that's it, it's over. He was hopeless. And as he began to share that with me, I looked at him and said, you know, Professor Joe, my father's dying, because at that time my dad was dying of cancer, same time. I said, but you know, my dad's lived a full life, but more important than that, he knows God. He's been a friend of God's for many, many years. He knows Jesus Christ. My dad is not afraid to die. He's made his peace with God, and he's not, he's not afraid to, God, uh, uh, to die, and he knows where he's going when he dies. He has hope. And I explained to him that that kind of hope that you get and the kind of power that you get to go through those kind of situations only comes from a relationship with God. You don't earn it. You don't work for it. You don't buy it. You don't deserve it. God's power in your life is simply a gift of his grace because God is good and God loves you and he made you. And I looked at Professor Joe and I said, Professor Joe, your heavenly father has a ticket for you to heaven. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You certainly never deserve it. You'll never be good enough on your own to get to heaven because heaven's perfect and you're not and neither am I. The only way you get this ticket to heaven, salvation, is by being a friend of the Father's Son. His name is Jesus Christ. And I looked up and this gentle man about in his 80s had tears coming down both sides of his cheek. And he looked up and he said to me in a simple, I'll never forget this moment, I still get goosebumps from it. He looked at me and said in simple English, Rick, I would like one of those tickets. Now, I've been in China many, many times, and Chinese people are among the most polite people in the world. They are amazingly polite. I didn't know if he meant it. He was just kind of being nice to me. I never, ever pressure anybody to make the most important decision in their life. You take the time you need to make it, because if you take the time and you're intellectually honest, you'll make the right decision. And I, I said, well, you know what? Why don't we do this? Why don't we just set it aside for a second? Let's finish our meals. And at the end of this meal, if you still want to open your life to Jesus Christ, it would be my honor to lead you in a simple prayer to invite Christ in your life, the provost of the Harvard of China. Well, we get to the end of the meal, we've talked about a bunch of other stuff, and, and uh, he brings it up again. He said, Rick, I, I would like one of those tickets. And so there with a table of Chinese officials, we held hands together and I led him in a simple prayer to open his life to receive all that Jesus Christ did for him by dying on the cross and rising again. It's a prayer similar to the one I'm gonna invite you to pray with me in just a second. 
And when he finished praying that prayer, he looked up and tears were coming down his cheeks again, but this time he's smiling. Now again, I didn't know if he meant it or not. I don't ever judge anybody's motive. The next morning I was preaching in the most famous church in China, Changwen Men Church, very famous church, about the size of the number of people here right now. And as I stood up to speak, who should walk in at the back door but the provost of the Harvard of China? Professor Joe, he walked to the front, to the front row, turned around and said, I am publicly proclaiming my faith in Christ. And the crowd went crazy because they knew who he was. 50 years of communist indoctrination, which the official policy is atheism. There is no God. So the official policy of communism is. None of that filled the hole in his heart when the heat was on when he was facing his own mortality. And the folks, the fact is, the mortality rate in the world is still 100%. Everybody's gonna die. Only a fool would go through life unprepared for what you know is inevitable. That's called denial. But he gave his life to Christ and what was impossible became possible. By the way, his, his cancer went into remission for about 10 more years and he began to uh, basically be a missionary to other professors. And I wrote him many, many letters over, over the next 10 years. But here's the promise. And I want you to have the same promise, the promise of purpose and the promise of power. First Peter chapter one, second Peter chapter one. As you get to know Jesus better, he will give you through his great power everything you need for living a truly good life. Now you say, well, Rick, I, I don't have everything I need. Well, then you just need to get to know Jesus better. As you get to know Jesus better, he's the source of your purpose and he's the source of your power. Now, let me quickly give you the third one. The third thing that I know for certain, not only is that God have a great purpose for your life and God has a great power to solve your problems, but here's the third one. God has a great place for me after I die. We learn that from the resurrection of Jesus. We learn that there is more to life than here and now. We learn that death is not the end. One day, your heart is gonna stop. That's gonna be the end of your body, but that's not gonna be the end of you. Oh, no, no, no. You were made to last forever. And God says, I have proven that there's life after death, by raising my own son. I think Jesus knows more about the afterlife than you do or I do, because he's been there. And this gives us hope. Death is not the end. And in John chapter 11, here's what Jesus said. I am the one who raises the dead and gives them life again. If you're gonna come back to life after your death, it's gonna be Jesus who does it. Nobody else is gonna do it. It's gonna be Jesus. He says, I am the one who raises the dead and gives them life. How do I know that he's telling the truth? Because he did it, nobody else did. It's one of the most attested to miracles in history. Jesus spent 40 days in Jerusalem after, he didn't just say bye to your friends and go back to heaven after he raised himself. He walked around, ate meals, talked to people, one time trained 500 people, many, many eyewitness accounts over 40 days. And he says, I am the one, anyone who believes in me, even though he dies, shall live again. And he gives, he is given eternal life for believing in me and shall never perish. How do you get eternal life? Not by doing good, not by going to church, not by promising me perfect, not by giving a whole lot of money to help the poor. He says one thing, you believe that Jesus can raise you back from the dead too. You trust him as your savior. He is the source of hope. Now, let me just summarize this. You're never gonna find ultimate hope in anything you can lose. If you wanna have a hope that gets you through the toughest times of life, you must put your hope and put your trust in something that cannot be taken from you. If you put your hope in your bank account, you can lose your bank account. If you put your hope in your spouse, you can lose your spouse. If you put your hope in your health, you can lose your health. 
You can lose your mind. You, can you must never put your hope in something that you could lose. Every year, Christians from all over the world remember the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ by traveling to Jerusalem where they walk the path that Jesus took on the way to the cross. That path is called the Via Dolorosa. Now, since you may not be able to ever travel to Jerusalem, I want to suggest a way for you to celebrate and reflect on and pray about what Jesus did for you on the cross. So I've created a brand new one-of-a-kind resource, Journey with Jesus a deluxe hardcover gift edition book that's illustrated with really beautiful, high quality glossy photos of mosaic tile artwork that reflect each of the stops that Jesus made on his journey to the cross. You're not ever gonna forget this gift. It's a great book to keep and to study over and over again. And it'd make a great gift for your family and your friends too. This one of a kind resource is only available through Daily Hope. Quantities are limited, so be sure to get yours today. Just call 844-467-3900 or visit dailyhopetv.com to get yours today. What I'm saying this Easter is that hope is not a principle. Hope is not a product. Hope is not a program. Hope is not a pill. I'll get this pill, then I'll have all the hope I need. Hope is a person. And there's only one person that you can put that hope in, Jesus Christ. He is the hope of the world. That's why it's split into AD and BC. That's why your birthday is dated according to this event. You need to get to know Jesus. And since Jesus raised himself from the dead, and we know that there's life after death, here's what we have. Look at the next verse. 1 Peter 1, now we live with a wonderful expectation because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So we know death's not the end. For God has reserved a priceless inheritance for his children, that's you who've trusted in him. It is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay, decay and God, in his mighty power, will protect you until you receive this salvation because you are trusting him. When you come to Jesus and you go, God, I'm giving you my whole life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's not clean up your life and then come to Jesus. It's like, God, here's my greasy hands, my dirty hands, my filthy hands. God, just all the mess in my life. I put my hand in your hand, and God grabs your hand. He puts your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the water, and he grabs your hand. And then, as life goes on, there are going to be some moments that you don't want to hold on to God's hand. God, I'm going to a party tonight with a bunch of unbelievers. I'd like to not be a believer for about an hour, okay? And I like to pull... And you may want to let go of God's hand, but he's not letting go of yours. Once you have been saved, he will keep you safe. That's the hope you have. A lot of people think, I don't want to give my life to God because what happens if I start on it and then I kind of mess up and screw up and fail and then I'll feel really stupid and then I lose my salvation. No, you won't. That's not what the Bible says. It is safe, secure, it's paid for, it's done, it's beyond the reach of change and decay. God in his mighty power will keep you saved. It's not your power. He does the saving. He didn't, he saves you, he keeps you saved. You don't save yourself. So what am I saying? That the Bible tells us because of the resurrection, we have hope because there's more to the story than just here and now. And we have hope because God protects your salvation and keeps it and you can't lose it. And that causes you to face the most difficult times in life with a whole new confidence. As a pastor, I have stood at, I couldn't count the number of grave sites that I've stood at in 40 years. I couldn't count the number of funerals that I've done. And so I'm a pretty good expert at knowing the difference between people who have hope and people who don't, because you can see it in their eyes. 
I have been at the funerals of people when nobody in the family knows God. Nobody in the family has the hope of the resurrection. Nobody in the family knows the hope of heaven. And for them, they're losing this person, they're never gonna see him again, and it's over. That's it, it's over. And the terror in their eyes is something you don't wanna see. I've seen it over and over and over. And I compare that to people who know the Lord, that when they use, lose a loved one who knows the Lord, they grieve, but they're not grieving for them because they know where they're going. They're grieving for themselves because they're gonna miss them. And it's a whole different kind of grief. It's a grieving with hope. You know, the older I get, uh, and the more of my family that's in heaven and the more of my friends that are in heaven, some great, great saints who've been in this church for over 30 years, and are going on. The more of my friends and family on the other side, the more heaven becomes attractive to me. I have to be honest with you, when I was a young man, heaven didn't seem very attractive to me. In the first place, no picture of it on earth is correct. I mean, the, the picture of heaven on earth right now that you hear, there's heaven. It's all white, there's no color in heaven. There's fog up to your feet. <laughs> you walk around, everybody's in a white robe with wings playing a harp. That would be hell. <laughs> if that's heaven, no thanks God. I just soon have my sunrise and sunsets and a cool surf. That's not heaven. You can't even understand what heaven's gonna be like. It's so cool. Even in a world that's broken, filled with suffering, sorrow, sadness, sickness, it's still a pretty cool place. We're enjoying it right now, outside. Most of you know that four years ago, the week after Easter, our family lost the youngest member. My youngest son, Matthew, after a lifelong battle with mental illness, died. And it was the worst day of my life and his brother and sister's life and his mom's life and everybody else in our family who loved him. Many times over the last four years, I've been asked, how, how, how did you handle that? How did you handle the death of a son who'd struggled his entire life with mental illness? I want you to listen very carefully because you're gonna have loss in your life, I guarantee it. There is no life without loss. There is no loss without pain. There is no pain without grief. You're going to go through this in life. So somebody who loves you, as your pastor, as your spiritual coach, that's my job to help you get, get ready for this kind of stuff. And listen carefully. The way you live with hope in the middle of pain is to enlarge your perspective, to change your viewpoint, to get your eyes off of what's happening right here and now, shift your perspective, change your focus, and begin to live in light of eternity. Here's what the Bible says, look on the screen. So we don't focus on the troubles we see right now. Instead, we look forward to what we don't see yet. For the troubles that we see now are temporary, but the joys that will come to last, that will last, will last forever. I mean, even if you had a chronic problem your entire life, it's only 100 years or 80 or 70. Nothing compared to thousands, tens of thousands, millions, and trillions of years in eternity. And the truth is, what comforts me when I think about the death of my son is not thinking about the happy moments in his past, but thinking about the holy moments he's having right now. That comforts me because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And because I know where he is, and if he was able to talk to me, and he can't, but if he was, he'd say, Dad, what are you worried about? This place is so cool, it's so great, it's far better than any of the sermons you preached about it. <laughs> and I can't wait for you to get here. That is my hope. We live in a society today, friends, that is filled with hopelessness. We, we are in an epidemic of hopelessness, hopelessness. I think it's one of the reasons why uh, you know, Purpose Driven Life was such a big seller because there was no 
and people are lacking hope and they're looking for hope and they, they wanna know where it is. And where is it? It's in God's word. It is in God's word. Look at this next verse. People wanna know about heaven. No eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, no mind has ever imagined the wonderful things that God has prepared for those who love him. He has a purpose for your life right now. He has a power to help you solve the problems tomorrow. And he has a place for you after you die. The reason why you can't explain heaven is because your brain power isn't big enough to handle it. It would be like an ant trying to understand the internet. We live in a 3D world, but there are dimensions that we don't even know about. And if God built this world and it's all broken now from sin, how much cooler is heaven going to be? You say, well, how do I get this? How do I get a new purpose in my life, God's purpose? How do I get a greater power in my life? And how do I get a greater place which becomes my ultimate hope that even when I'm going through tough down, I'm going, this is not the end of the story. I have read the last chapter of the book, we win. It doesn't always look good, but I've read the last chapter, we win. Sometimes you're going through a tough time in your life and really what you're feeling is, the world is coming to an end. And that's the way you feel. The world is coming to an end, no. A season may be coming to an end. A moment in your life may be coming to an end. But it's not the end of the world. Why? Because when the world ends, Jesus is coming back. And that's our hope. Let's bow our heads. Because of the resurrection, we know for certain that God has a great purpose for your life, has a greater power for your problems, and has a wonderful place for you after you die. How do you get these benefits? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what the Bible says. So I want the honor and the privilege of leading you in a very simple prayer, much like Professor Joe prayed in Beijing. It doesn't matter what your background is, you may be Buddhist or Muslim or Mormon or Methodist or Baptist or Buddhist or atheist or Catholic or doesn't matter what background you are. Jesus isn't interested in your religion. He's interested in you having a relationship with God. And you just confess it to God. So why don't you pray these prayers? So I'll just say a little prayer. And you, it doesn't even matter the words you say. It's that you be humble. If you're humble before God and say, God, I need you. That's it. So just say, dear God, just say that in your mind. Dear God, I do not want to go through life not knowing my purpose. Thank you that my life is not an accident. Thank you that you planned me whether my parents did or not. And that you've loved me every moment of my life. And so today, as much as I know how, I wanna open my life to Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for me and rose again so that I could have hope. Jesus Christ, I want to know God's purpose for my life. And I wanna spend the rest of my life learning it and fulfilling it. And Jesus Christ, I, I wanna put my trust in your power. I wanna plug in starting today. I'm gonna stop living on my own power and start living by your power. I know that you're greater than any problem I face. In Jesus Christ, I ask you to reserve a place for me in your heaven, in your home. I wanna to learn to love you and to know you, to follow you. Thank you for loving me even before I knew you. Thank you for dying for me before I even was created. But you knew I would be. And so I humbly ask you to accept me into your family 
then I may experience all the benefits of what you did 2,000 years ago. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Every year, Christians from all over the world remember the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ by traveling to Jerusalem where they walk the path that Jesus took on the way to the cross. That path is called the Via Dolorosa. Now, since you may not be able to ever travel to Jerusalem, I wanna suggest a way for you to celebrate and reflect on and pray about what Jesus did for you on the cross. So I've created a brand new one-of-a-kind resource, Journey with Jesus a deluxe hardcover gift edition book that's illustrated with really beautiful, high quality glossy photos of mosaic tile artwork that reflect each of the stops that Jesus made on his journey to the cross. You're not ever gonna forget this gift. It's a great book to keep and to study over and over again. And it'd make a great gift for your family and your friends too. This one of a kind resource is only available through Daily Hope. Quantities are limited, so be sure to get yours today. Just call 844-467-3900 or visit dailyhopetv.com to get yours today.